Have you ever pondered keeping chickens, bees, or other livestock in your urban backyard? Join Urban Farm U in our upcoming free webinar, Urban Farms in Balance, to discover how urban livestock can provide healthy, natural food for your family, increase your farm's biodiversity, improve your fruit and veggie production, and help you achieve a regenerative, holistic farm system. And what's not to love about all that free manure for your garden? Integrating animals and insects in your urban farm has never been easier. And you'll leave feeling confident about which animals are best for your backyard and exactly what steps you need to take to make that happen. Signing up for this free webinar is easy. Just text CHICKENS to 33444 and you'll be enjoying the gifts of milk, eggs, honey, and more in no time. That's CHICKENS to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Sarika Serenos of The Funky Kitchen to talk about her experience with cooking for maximum nutrition. Sarika is a nationally certified practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine and Chinese herbal medicine, practicing Japanese-style acupuncture. She teaches on the importance and the practice of traditional food through her program, Fresh, Fun, and Flavorful in the Funky Kitchen, and is the author of The Funky Kitchen and founder of NaturallyLivingToday.com. She is a coach for Metabolic Balance of Germany, serves on the board of directors for the National Association of Nutritional Professionals, and is an instructor for Women's Wellness Academy, and is a member of Weston A. Price Foundation. She resides in Northern Arizona with her husband and two children. Welcome to the show today, Sarika. Thank you so much, Greg. I am thrilled to be here. It's exciting. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think sometimes calling call us and that's exactly what happened with me. Even when I was in high school, I was trying to kind of help friends with their nutrition, Mm -hmm. even though I didn't know what I was doing. And so it was it was it's always been a lifelong pursuit to really try and help people. And so after I'd gotten my degree in business, I uh, continued with my study at that point in traditional Chinese medicine after I'd had my wonderful own personal experience with that and how profound it was in helping me with some of the digestive issues I was having. And so at that point, I that study was a four and a half year program. And in that study, I, I looked at nutrition from the perspective of Western as well as Eastern perspective, where we really got more into the energetics of food, not just the macronutrient profile. And so that was really a lot of fun for me. And it continued to kind of grow this interest that I had. And I've now been practicing um, Japanese style acupuncture and herbal medicine. Um, Well, since 2001, I've been licensed. And Mm -hmm. so it's been a tremendous thing to be able to work with folks in this capacity. I love it. But I always really kind of have a mental note whenever I'm working with patients that I really don't want them seeing me very often. And it's with the intent that I give them homework, if you will. And one of the very base parts of that homework is working with their nutrition and how we can make changes with that. And, you know, it's so important because, you know, you'll have folks that are vegetarian or you'll have folks that are even vegan or, you know, paleo diet or whatever the thing is. In any of these stripes of eating, there are going to be ways that we can always improve upon what we're doing. So I'm never going to tell somebody that they shouldn't be eating, you know, a vegan diet if they're really committed to that. But what I learned through the years, um, through, again, our own personal family experience and and working a lot with organic food and gluten-free food, and then us still having issues, it was just so crazy to me. I couldn't believe it. And that's when I really started studying, okay, it's not so much, you know, spending a ton of money on groceries. There's a missing piece here. Mm-hmm. 
And that's when I really started looking at the preparation of the foods. Uh Uh And that is where we go back to, you know, how our ancestors, you know, seem to have done things and how we've really moved away from that in our modern setting. And we're all running around holding the bag on that. I mean, it's just a mess that has been created. And there's a there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the simplest things that we can do is just make some tweaks to how we prepare food and it can have a profound effect on the bioavailability of the nutrition that we're consuming, whether you're vegan or paleo or whatever the thing may be. Right. And so that's part of the homework that I that I do with people is, you know, helping them to understand how we can work with their nutrition and also how they space their meals in the day. All of those things have such bearing on a person's vitality and, and their longstanding energy for the day. So wow. it's just quite a it's quite a fun thing to work within. So what's one tweak? that we can do to our diet that will make it that much better. Right. You know, I would say that one tweak for sure would be, gosh, there are so many that that I love. Uh And I always think about a person uh, from their constitutional perspective, too. Oh, yes. Uh You know, and I so I kind of look at it from a Chinese and an Ayurvedic perspective. And so, you know, what may be appropriate for one person isn't Mm. necessarily going to be the total (laughs) right fit for the next person, you know? That being said. (laughs) I was going to say, people ask me open-ended questions about permaculture all the time. And 100% of the time, the answer is, well, it depends. I know. And that's what I just got from you. (laughs) It depends. It does. And But, you know, I would say that one thing for sure that I can kind of across the board say to people, Mm -hmm. and this isn't going to talk so much about traditional food preparation, but rather about the pacing of meals. Mm, Yes. Um, Kind of across the board, what I would recommend is people really look at what their behavior is around breakfast. And what I see a lot of people do is they get up and they have a stimulant before they eat. Uh, So that stimulant could be coffee, it could be mate, it could be tea, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to do and based off of a person's constitution it's going to do it more for one person over the next some right. people may not have as strong of, a, of an effect but in either in any case what it is going to do is begin to set them up on a little bit of an energetic roller coaster for the day oh uh, yes that where makes they're sense going to have peaks and valleys in their energy and really i think all of us what we want in our day is you know just even energy we don't want to have an afternoon crash we right. don't want to have a late Late morning crash. We don't want to feel crabby if we miss a meal you know, by an hour or something. And so, um, really, uh, the one thing we can all look at is what we do first thing in the morning when we mm-hmm. get up. If a person's having a stimulant, my suggestion is to bring that into a meal rather than taking it on an empty stomach. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. So you talk about traditional food preparation. Let's kind of unpack that a bit and talk about what that is. What is it? Right. Well, the way that I see it um, and the way that, you know, I wrote the book about and everything, it's it, it's about using different methods that pre-digest the food for us is really what it comes mm. down to. And so that doesn't sound appetizing at all. It doesn't at all. And I, you know what, one of these days I'll come up with a really great word and I'm going to copyright that word and I'm going to make <laughs> t-shirts out of it because it's not pre-digestion. I know that much. Yeah. <laughs> But what it is, is it is something that takes the heavy lifting of breaking down Mm. uh, macronutrients into smaller components. And so one example of that is culturing and fermentation. Oh, right. Yeah. So that would be taking milk and then you culture it and then you have converted it into yogurt or to milk kefir. Um, Another way of doing that would be vegetable matter. And, you know, you could end up with some sauerkraut or, um, you know, kimchi, something like that. Right. Another way of doing it is, you know, if a person's consuming uh, grains and beans, like, you know, I mean, golly, with vegetarians and vegans, you don't have much if you're not eating uh, grains and beans. Right. And that's a group that for whom it is incredibly important, especially vegans, that they do methods like I'm going to be talking about here because already the amino acid and mineral profile that they have to work with is less than a person who has a much more omnivorous diet. Right. You know? And so when we don't do a method such as 
fermentation, which is something that I suggest people do on the grains and beans, Mm -hmm. and at the very least soaking them so that you begin to break down some of the anti-nutrients that can block uh, mineral absorption and uptake. That's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And also uh, getting in the way of the ability to break down proteins. Um, All of this has such bearing. And when we look at the tools anthropologically of, of humans from long, long ago, go, we can see that there were, there were even in, in Africa, you know, so there's been this saying in the paleo movement that grains are very new to the uh, human diet, you know, the last 10,000 years or so. Right. Well, in fact, there have been stores of, of archaeological finds in Africa that date back to 100,000 years that uh, not only have very clear evidence that there were a ton of different tools they were using to process grains, but then the grains there, you know, the, res- the residue of that was there as well. Wow. So we really do seem to have quite a history of consuming grains, but also tinkering with them so that we can use them in our body. And so uh, soaking the grains is something that um, is also a very important pre-digestion method. Mm -hmm. And like I teach in my class, uh, it's also something I like to ferment during that time because then you get additional activity on that food. Fermented grains? With grains, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, so something other than beer, then is that what we're talking about? It is, although <laughs> that's that's very nice too. <laughs> yeah. So yes, something other than that. Um, another method uh, that is incredibly popular these days is good old broth. Oh um, yes. And you know that is a pre-digestion method as well because, oh, especially if we're talking about you know everybody's consuming bone broth, mm-hmm. but even the vegetable broth. I mean, what a broth allows you to do is it allows you to take the things that might be too tough or fibrous mm-hmm. in the case of bones or animal tissues, uh, things that we just don't have the dentition and the jaw strength to get through the way that a, a carnivore would. But we're omnivorous, and so it is something that we're designed to eat but been able to do it because we've tinkered with it and so we put it into a water base and we let it cook for a long period of time and in either case of vegetable matter or of animal matter what we're dealing with then is something that allows us to take those tough bits put them into the solution of the broth and then they become very bioavailable for us mm, right yeah, so those those are kind of some of the highlights. I also get into low heat dehydration. So once we've soaked something and we want to maintain the enzyme activity of it, right? Um, we want to low heat dehydrate it. We don't want to put it into the oven and really toast it up. Mm-hmm. So that's another one. Yeah, that's cool. that. I would say that that kind of covers it. And what you're doing, I mean, <laughs> when I teach this to other healthcare practitioners, that's almost like my easiest group to teach to because they get it. Right. Um, you know, when I say this to the public, I think, oh gosh, I hope I'm not turning people off. But what it is is that. When you do these methods, you're really, in many respects, taking the domain of your belly. And you're taking that action and doing it on the countertop. And so by the time it hits your mouth, Mm -hmm. it is something that is ready to be put to use. And Greg, you and I both know that for so many reasons, people are so taxed these days. Oh, yes. And so, you know, you could be feeding someone an awesome, awesome on the page diet, but if they're not able to break that down and put it to use in their bodies, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. So this helps them to do that so that it's easier for them to put that to use. Nice. Yeah. I have an interesting question here for you. Okay. Why do you think all this matters so much? Well, because of what I just said. People are exhausted. And we've Mm. moved away from these methods over the last 60 to 80, 100 years or so. And all you have to do is look at the decimation of the human experience and say, you know what? We're kind of off track here. And so if we can assist the body in taking in and putting to use its nutrition, it's the simplest, most profound, sublime thing we can do. Mm. Perfect. Perfect. So what are some of the outcomes of really putting this type of of, uh, information, this type of diet to use? 
Right. You know, I work with people with just different types of things that are going on in their mm-hmm. lives. I'm a, I'm a natural general practitioner is what I am. And so I have a lot of people that I work with who say, I can't eat this, I can't eat this, I can't eat this, I can't eat this. And, you know, they have like six things they can eat or they think they can eat. And what I find is with doing these methods, it allows greater inclusion of nutrition because I don't think it's going to take a rocket scientist to recognize that you're not going to get full vitality off of eating the same six foods over and over again. Mm-hmm. And honestly, if a person's gut and system is that compromised, eventually they're going to start having issues with those six foods. And so then you think, okay, well, I'll, I'll be an air fern. You know, I'm just going to get by on oxygen. Right. I mean, that just isn't a way to, it, you just get painted into a corner. And so one of the greatest attributes, uh, in my opinion, of, of putting this type of thing to use is it increases the versatility the and and in turn the vitality for people because they're bringing in greater nutrition they're pulling from other sources than they thought that they could and even in those instances i would never say to somebody yes my gosh i know you know you had a sensitivity to x y or z you know go eat a ton of it after it's been fermented mm-hmm. never do that but to be able to bring in small amounts that have been prepared properly and part of a simple meal is so it's it's heart lifting is what it is because it's you can imagine the frustration the underlying frustration of i can't eat what everybody else is eating oh yeah you know yep and to be able to begin to lift that a bit for somebody is mm-hmm. such a huge gift such a huge gift yeah so to me that is quite honestly at its heart that's like the biggest reason for doing this perfect so how do Chinese medicine, acupuncture, both of which you work in, and nutrition work together as a holistic health regime? Very fluidly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. I, and it's, Greg, you know, I, we, as practitioners in whatever we do, whatever our career choice is, mm-hmm. you know, over time we evolve and we, we, it really kind of becomes like who we are and we do it our own very unique way. And so the way that I practice all of that together, it really is um, a very synergistic way of supporting a person. I would feel like my hands were tied behind my back. Mm-hmm. One of those legs was taken away. I work with a lot of people from a distance uh, through, you know, with their nutrition and mm-hmm. their lifestyle. And eventually, uh, nine times out of ten, I get to a point where I just say, we have got to also now find you someone in your area who can help you with some acupuncture. Right. Um, because going in for a massage is so wonderful. Um, going in for a chiropractic adjustment is so wonderful. There's great, great body therapies. And I love them. Um, but acupuncture, just like having a chiropractic adjustment or a massage, they're all going to speak differently to the body Mm -hmm. and I find that a really solid acupuncture treatment is one of the finest ways to get the body to start healing because when it's when it when it's happening right the person who is being treated goes from a sympathetic override presentation into a parasympathetic relax respond and heal presentation and I I when I'm working on someone and they go there you can um, probably see that can't you Oh, the the breathing, everything changes. Right. And it is such uh, an honor to be in the presence of that kind of healing that their body is doing. I mean, I'm there to direct traffic and Mm -hmm. help guide the process a bit, but they're the ones that are healing. And, you know, I've never been one to call myself a healer or anything like that because I believe with my heart it's not me. I'm there to direct traffic. Mm -hmm. But it is that person. And if we give the body that opportunity to relax that deeply and then outside of the treatment experience, if we have been giving it direction on how, you know, better sleep hygiene, uh, you know, more sound bioavailable nutrition, uh, some ideas around exercise that help but don't harm. I mean, so many different little trinkets, you know, that also fill in the void. Uh, It's amazing the synergy that happens with all of that. It's really beautiful. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So you have a free webinar coming up and I kind of want to 
look at that a little bit. What sure. what is it? Yeah. Tell us about it. It is, um, you know, it's it's about helping people, even if they aren't stepping into creating, you know, traditional food methods in their kitchen. Mm-hmm. It is about getting people to get into the habit of using some tools so that they're preparing more food at home and having food ready to go at home. Yeah. So they're, they're time-saving ideas. And it's stuff that, that I use. And my patients and the people I work with, they so appreciate this information because I am going to be 45 here soon. Mm-hmm. I was raised in a time of convenience foods. Oh, yes. And so, you know, yes, that's... It, it, all of us were, most of us were anyway. Um, that whole skill set around the forethought of taking care of the future you is, right. you know, I mean, people just were not, we weren't trained to do that. <laughs> so it's something that I've certainly had to learn and it's so impactful. And even eating as well as we do in our family, um, if, if for some reason, things slide and we're not taking care of the future us we're very quickly into the same boat as everybody else where it's like oh gosh what are we going to eat now mm-hmm. so the the webinar is really about starting to get people thinking about how they can save time by making food at home and and also save money by doing so because you know a lot of families are they're very pushed and they think oh if i eat organically or mm-hmm. you know, any of this stuff is going to cost me so much money and it's not oh my gosh on you know on the occasion that we do go out to eat i'm shocked at how expensive it is to feed a family of four mm-hmm. oh my you gosh know? it's incredible it's incredible and so you know it's that's what it's about it's just very practical information to help people start to gain that skill set fantastic how do people find out about it and sign up Good. Um, well, it's it's a very simple URL. Uh-huh. It is funkykitchenfresh.com. That will allow them to get to the page where they just give me uh, their first name and their email, and then they will be on our list so that they know when the webinar begins. And they'll have that. The webinar itself is going to be live, mm-hmm. and um, at the very end of it, I'm going to have a few minutes of Q&A for questions around you know, what the content was was and so yeah it, it's fun I love sharing this stuff with people. fantastic I can tell you're very passionate about it <laughs> so do you have any tips for people who want to find a healthier balance between their diet and lifestyle I would say another one so really breakfast is where I start with everybody so please everyone take that to heart okay and uh-huh. then don't go eat a cold cereal breakfast that really give yourself more nutrition than that at the beginning of the day because it really is going to set the tone and even affect your sleep for the next night wow. so and that's a big one so the other part of that is Be- also before you leave that one though yes no go ahead so yogurt is fermented right correct so that's a co- that could be considered a cold cereal breakfast if you put some cereal on it is that more permissible you know i'm not a fan of cold cereal Mm. and i Mm -hmm. used to eat a lot of it (laughs) it was my dinner and sometimes my breakfast too Mm. and i also used to have tremendous issues with my blood sugar and i'm not saying the cold cereal was the only culprit however it was big player there was some research that was done back in the 60s around um extruded cereal so extruded grain cereal so that would be like a flake cereal right um, or a puff cereal and there are protein structures that are in the grain and when we put them through an extrusion process with high heat high pressure or we puff them that way so like even a rice cake would fall under that kind of paradigm as well right um these research studies showed on autopsy with animals that were fed these foods uh, and these were omnivorous animals as well it's not like they were feeding you know these foods to animals it wouldn't necessarily eat those grains in a standard form and in fact that was part of the test structure as well was right. feeding them the same grain but just not in a cold cereal format mm-hmm. and it showed that well these animals out of all the different test subjects and one of and one of the testing groups was also uh, feeding vitamin water and the box that the cereal came in oh. to these animals so that was one of the test groups um, another was what well, they were rats so another was rat chow 
And then the other was a cold cereal. And at this time, one of the studies was for cornflakes. And so this was cornflakes from the 1960s. This was cornflakes before high fructose corn syrup. This right. is cornflakes before GMO. Before it got adulterated. Exactly. All of that. So, I mean, it's the cleaner version of a cornflake. Mm-hmm. And in these different groups of rats that were studied, uh, the one that expired the first before the box rats or anything was the cold cereal group. Oh, interesting. And before those animals died, they began displaying very erratic and very volatile behavior Mm -hmm. um, and uh, biting and um, just really um, harsh behavior. And then they would have spasms and they would die. And so they did autopsy on these animals. And what they found was that uh, there was a lot of degradation that had happened with these animals along the nervous systems. And there were a lot of issues related to their organ function as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and what it is, is there are these uh, protein structures in the grain because, you know, grain is a, it's going to mm-hmm. have protein, carbohydrate and fat. And these protein structures really become kind of like shrapnel when they oh, have been uh, denuded in this puffed or shredded format. And so that's what we're talking about here. That was a long answer to your question, but that's why we don't eat cold cereal. And it's interesting because people <laughs> like they'll hear this and they'll say, but, but I eat an organic you know whole grain cereal and right. that actually is worse <laughs> oh. because it's going to have a higher protein structure because it's a whole grain as opposed to something that has been more refined and so they're true and and I'm not even talking about what a food like that does to one's blood sugar mm. um, and so anywho's it's a bit of an issue and so no I'm not a fan of cold cereal I do like oats um, and you know so to have your yogurt with some oatmeal to mm-hmm. me that's a much better breakfast than yeah. taking your cold yogurt and adding, you know, some kind of cold, cold cereal. Oh, well, there you go. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> so you have a book, The Funky Kitchen. In fact, we've been friends for a while and I remember yes. when it came out and how excited you were. <laughs> Tell us about it, please. <laughs> well, The Funky Kitchen is that. Um, it's a, a book that I created originally for other healthcare practitioners. And it was part of a class I was teaching. And one of the other uh, practitioners who was there with me, who'd written at that time 15 books of his own. So oh my gosh. no problem for him. His name's Dr. Jack Tips. And Jack said to me, Srika, you've got everything here to m- write a book. You should do that. And so I did. And so the first version of the book was for this event that I was teaching at. And then I got to looking at it and I thought, you know what? I made that very simple and clear. I broke it down into, you know, just simple chapters and kind of followed the same method throughout so that people could just learn one method and then move on to the next. And so I reissued the book with some new photography just shortly after the first edition. Mm. And that's what the book is. And you know, it's a lot to rewrite a book and to make oh, changes. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, you know that. And so um, part of why I, I created my course, it's because it takes the book and turns it into a living document. And it allows me to work with people with their very specific um, proclivities to where they live, you know, temperature, what they have available to them to work with, their own, you know, dietary concerns and whatnot. And it's really cool because the class itself is something that I end up getting people from all around the world in it. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, It's so wonderful. And so, I mean, you know, what I'm going to suggest to somebody in Guam is going to be different than I would suggest to someone in Germany. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's really neat. Cool. Fantastic. Where can people find your book at? Let's just go there. Oh, it's on Amazon. All right. Cool. (laughs) Funky, the Funky Kitchen. The Funky Kitchen. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to shift a little bit on you and I want to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Right. You know, it, it, when you're working with food, <laughs> mm. you bump into failure sometimes, you know, you just do. And I know this may sound like a trite thing, but it's a really cool thing because, again, I think we get kind of scared around food sometimes when it's something that we've not been raised with in terms of preparation. and Right. 
you know, and, and also quite honestly, when you're doing these traditional methods, um, you know, sometimes if you're fermenting or culturing, you think, oh my gosh, am I going to make myself sick? I've had this stuff out on the counter for a day, you know, that right. sort of thing. So there's a lot of faith and trust. And that's why I, I handhold with everybody as we're going through the class. But the, the thing that happens a lot is, you know, gosh, the texture on this didn't turn out right or whatever that thing may be. Now, if it's mold, it gets chucked. There there's no, I don't work with mold. That doesn't happen. But sometimes, you know, like a, a batter or a dough for the bread, we just added too much water to it. Mm. And so rather than, you know, crying in my bread dough, uh, <laughs> I look at it and I say, you know, I'm going to make pancakes out of that. And so, you know, mm. then I'll whip up all the other ingredients for pancakes, which right. would be the eggs and the milk and coconut oil and everything, and incorporate that into that very wet, what should have been bread dough. And then we've got pancakes cakes to last us all week and they just get reheated in the toaster oven and the kids are stoked it's all good and so right. you know it sounds like a trite thing but that I have seen people do that so it's kind of like the traditional food preparation um, saying you know of you know making lemonade out of lemons this is making pancakes out of bread dough <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> so what do you consider your biggest success oh golly that's a nice question. I don't know. I think when we do this kind of work, we don't sit and think about those things too much, do we? Because you just stay busy doing what you do. And you just, I think, I think my biggest success is finding, one, finding the husband I found because he is awesome. Oh, nice. He's totally supported me being me. And in doing so, it has allowed me to continue to just follow my inspiration in the career path that has has chosen me. That's been a real one-two punch. I'm very grateful. Cool. What drives you? What's your big why? You know, my big why is never settling for being told that there isn't an answer. I, there's uh, that just doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's part of why I practice Chinese medicine. It's a completely different paradigm of looking at the world and people's health and, and, you know, the entire cosmos. So it's a way that allows me to continue to just keep digging a little bit deeper. There's never a set in stone answer. And so I, it's that just recognizing that there's always going to be another way we can look at things. Great. So I'm all about education and I have to know what one book has been most influential in your life in this process. In this process, uh, I would say that the book that, and it's interesting because I don't, anyways, the one that really got me going with traditional food preparation was actually The Maker's Diet. And it was a book written by Jordan Rubin. And it's not that he so much went into traditional food preparation, but it was the first book that I read that really spoke to me about the importance of kind of looking at how our ancestors did things. Mm, right. And then from that, that's when I moved on to Weston A. Price's work and that sort of thing. But I got to give credence to that book, The Maker's Diet. That is really what started me on the path. And then, you know, and then you find where he probably took his inspiration were, you know, from the people before him. I would say that. Perfect. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Have good sleep. That's very important. Get oh, a good night's yes. rest so that the next day you're not craving a bunch of carbohydrates mm -hmm. um, while you're trying to pick up your energy. And so really be mindful of how you set yourself up for sleep every night. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today and sharing your experience, with Sarika. Oh, thank you, Greg. I love being here. Absolutely. So I just want to represent here real quick how our listeners can get a hold of you and your funky kitchen webinar that you've got coming up here so mm -hmm. speak to that again real quick yes you bet funky kitchen fresh dot com is that and then if folks want to just kind of check me out generally um, my my blog is naturally living today dot com and you can meet me there and um, I've got a little giveaway on the landing page there I've got a lot of video work I've done and whatnot lots of recipes and ideas about living more naturally in the modern world fantastic thank you well that's thanks. it for today thanks for joining us on the urban farm podcast would you like to grow your own healthy, organic food? Once you know the secrets, it's really quite simple. 
Imagine saving money at the grocery store, increasing your intake of organic whole foods, cultivating greater food security, and feeling more connected to the earth. Let Urban Farm U diffuse your gardening doubts in our upcoming free webinar, Gardening Unearthed. We will walk you through the seven key factors for growing your own healthy, organic food easily and without any hard labor. Just text the word GARDEN to 44222 to sign up for your free webinar or visit urbanfarm.org for more information. With the right knowledge in place, there's no such thing as a black thumb. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 to sign up for your free gardening webinar. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.